sort of, it's, it's intriguing. We go, oh, everyone here is also dressed as a furry. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I picked that example, but I'm sort of bothered by my own. Does that make sense? So, so I, it's, I, I, I'm still going to have some troubles, but I think my troubles are going to be minimized if I can go, oh, okay, what group are, okay, you know, you're not wearing, you know, the culturally whatever, Oh, well, you're, okay, you're over here. Okay, you're a part of that group. Well, now, now I just go, all right, you're a goth. You know, or emo, or whatever. And, and, and I'm helped out again. Versus, you got to sort of imagine, if you were really exercising your free will, literally every day you might wake up and go, you know, I'm going to wear, you know, a skirt today, uh, you know, paired with, and you just would, you, you know. And um, we don't do that. Does that help? All right, so furthermore, I am going to argue for this position because if I have tools that help me, I should use them. If I am helped out by knowing where you are in this culture, knowing your subgroup, it strikes me that even if there's a sort of tinge of denial of free will, which I'm not trying to, I should still at least use that tool. Let me give you an example, a very, very simple example to show how I can, I can use very simple tools that will help me. Let's say that I wanted to locate, let's go with Waldo. Where's Waldo? Right, and I'm trying to figure out where on the planet he is. Do I, let's, so here we have a map of the planet. I apologize that, uh, let's see, so here we have the globes, here we have South America, North America. As a first approximation, if I'm trying to locate this guy somewhere on the globe, as a first approximation, what might I do to say where he's at? Is he most likely in the water or in the land? <laughs> the land. Now, water makes up most of our planet, but I will go, well, he's probably somewhere on land. Is there any way that I could further narrow down where he might be on land? Populated regions. So I might look at populated regions. So if I wanted to look at populated regions, I might go, okay, notice here, these are all where the most populated areas are. By, this is light being thrown off into space. Is this too dark if I do it this way? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so I might go, now, there's a whole host of assumptions that get thrown in there. It's like, is he hiding from me or is he trying to be found? I don't know. <laughs> but I at least have some stabs at where I can narrow this down. I think I should use those stabs. I, they, they, they narrow down the globe for me. And if I'm trying to figure out what kind of clothing someone's going to wear, this is helpful. Now, while I figure out you're going to wear a t-shirt versus a button-down, I'm not 100% on that one. That's how we do with the second one, these first two objections. Right? Um, third, these data are not inevitable. If there's anything that a, that a study of history, a study of culture should tell you, is that people can almost organize any kind of society they want. If you go across the globe, there are some trends that we will see over and over. There's some trends. And there's about five things that show up in almost every single culture, uh, these, these dominant cultural trends. But really, there's a lot of variability, a lot of variability in culture. So they're not inevitable. None of this is to imply that we have to wear pants or the world will end. So we don't, right? Because we don't, we don't have to divide people into colors of skin any more than we do lobs of ears. And yet, sir, we do. We like color of skin. <clears throat> you no. Know. Any questions about this? This objection. Rejoinder, I should technically say. All right. We have to directly confront a term known as the naturalistic fallacy. Has anyone heard this term before? What is the naturalistic fallacy? The idea that just because something's natural, it's automatically good or desirable. It's automatically good.
good or desirable. So one way of phrasing it is just like that. that whatever is the, the, the naturalistic fallacy is saying that because something is natural, then it's good. So, I, so in a very simplistic example, I might say sugar is natural, therefore sugar is good. Uh, that's one form of it. Um, but you also might think of it as the naturalistic fallacy is when people say what is the case ought to be the case. So what you find when you go across the globe is that in many cultures, males dominate females. The naturalistic fallacy would be to say what? that males should dominate females, because that is in the order of things. That is a fallacy. The fallacy is assuming that what is ought to be the case. Now, people also throw on top of that that it is good that it's the case, that it's right that it's the case, but you hear this over and over and over. You might hear someone say, well, Females are able to have babies, therefore they should have babies. Fallacy. Uh, humans divide people into colors of skin, therefore we should divide people into colors of skin. That's a fallacy. That we do it doesn't mean we ought to do it. So I'm going to be speaking over and over in this course uh, about what people are doing. I'm going to say many things about people's actual behavior. In many cultures, males dominate females. I do not think they should dominate females, but the goal of my class is to predict and explain behavior, not dictate it. Right? My goal is not as a preacher to say how you should act. My goal is to go, huh, here's what I find when I go across the globe. Any questions about this, this naturalistic fallacy? So to give some examples in, in the history of our culture, many cultures, many cultures have had slavery as part of their cultural uh, legacy. If someone were to say, oh, therefore slavery is natural and normal and good, what should you say back now? I mean, it is as much a fallacy if I were to say one plus two makes four. It's a fallacy. You've made a mistake. And you go, oh, yeah, I made the naturalistic fallacy. Duh. All right. Oh, but I will tell you, this shows up all the time. It, it's almost like you just want to have a stamp that reads naturalistic fallacy. Naturalistic fallacy. Um, um, like... To give one example, people often say women are more nurturing, therefore women should stay home with the kids. <laughs> you want to have a stamp that says that. That's a fallacy. All right. Um, all right. One last objection. All right. I've talked about the atomistic, uh, atomistic perspective, but why not start with individual people? We're psychologists. We love people. That's what I do. Why not start with individual people? And I, the real answer here comes not from philosophy or any of those fields. The real answer here, I think, can be best understood in terms of meteorology. I know you're thinking, how many fields are involved in this thing? <laughs> ah, let's say that you want to take a meteorology class, and y'all know I have. Uh, <laughs> I love to learn. Uh, all right, so if, if there's some meteorologist watching this at home, I'm going to butcher your field about right now. Let's say you want to predict whether or not there's going to be clouds on a single day. If you want to predict clouds on one day, you have to know about a half dozen variables precisely defined. You have to know the relative humidity, how much moisture is in the, in, in the air. You have to know the temperature. You have to know, um, God, there's like five others of these that I just, I'm, like, I'm not a meteorologist. But you have to know about five precisely defined variables to predict clouds on one day. Do we have that yet for
for psychology? No. I don't have yet that if I have Alex and five of her traits, I can predict. I don't have that for people yet. But even if I did, I run up against another major problem. And this also comes from meteorology. There was a man named Edward Lorenz. Has anyone heard of Edward Lorenz? Well, now you will. Edward Lorenz was trying to run some climate models. And the story goes that he ran his models, and let's say for the sake of example, he ran and he rounded off his precisely defined variables to five digits. So he's like, oh, what's the temperature? It is 37.349 whatever. I said five, 37.349. Okay, good, I got five. So he runs his model, and he finds various, he's like, okay, the temperature's going to go up, it's going to go down, you know, whatever. The temperature's going to do whatever it does. And then he wanted to check his model, but he was running out of time. So instead of using five digits, he used four or three. I don't remember which one it was. Feel free to correct me. And then he re-ran the model. The same precise model, same data, only rounded to fewer decimals. And instead of the model being the same, it varied. So you get one model, so they follow each other fairly closely, and then you can see the models started getting really, really off. In this situation, he had precisely defined variables, a precise model, but simply rounding created a problem. And what he argued is there is, and this is a phrase that we're going to know, a sensitive dependence on initial conditions. That is, the precision of our initial measurements is going to influence our later predictions. Well, I ask again, do we yet have precisely measured variables and precise mathematical equations to predict you? No. If meteorology doesn't have it yet, I guarantee you we don't. And that's why I'm not going to start with you. What I am going to do, if, if you imagine what I'm going to do instead of starting with you, in this way, I'm going to, I'm going to try to work it back 